I recall waking up to the excitement of my last week of school and thinking about how I wanted to take it all in. I was going to visit each and every school that I had worked in and take pictures and really bask in those moments. Then I receive a call from my sister, Tina. My heart sank. I knew instinctively that something was wrong and it was bad news. I gathered myself to go into the building, but I broke down at the door as I wept. My sister had been admitted into ICU. I picked myself up to let my boss know that I would have to rush home immediately. She knew instinctively in my voice that I was not okay. She and my coworker, they came over and immediately tried to help me navigating, trying to book a flight. This is something I've done countless times, but this time I couldn't find anything familiar on the keyboard. So we found a flight for that afternoon. I make it home and prepare for my flight to visit with my sister and make it, and I make it to the flight. So I'm on the last leg of my flight and while waiting, I check my messages. I noticed someone was offering me condolences. I was shocked because it was someone I had not heard from in years. I immediately called home and there was no answer. No one would answer me. I kept calling until someone picked up the phone and stated, it's true. I remember feeling the most alone I had ever felt in my life. I remember feeling so small and so insignificant. I realized that nothing to me mattered at that moment. There was no one to console me. There was no one to share the huge loss. The whole world stood still for me at that moment. And I was trying to make sense of the world around me. I noticed people smiling, people with families and those still rushing to catch their flight. I was left with empty thoughts of finality and a life without my sister and the flight attendant offering me a small bag of tissues. My sister was gone. That's where I'm meeting some of you tonight with buried hopes, buried dreams and buried messages. Some of us are one step away from cracking You've isolated, put on the empty smile, and, and some of you are just functioning grievers. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you in this space, but I encourage you, take off that mask, sit in the space of trueness and allow yourself to be vulnerable. Allow yourself to be encouraged and know that you are not in this alone and you will get through this, but you have to be honest with yourself and allow yourself to walk through the feelings and the pain. Not in my time, but in your own time. Tonight, I encourage you to unbury the buried messages related to grief and allow yourself the time and the, the space and the time to go through those healing moments. We welcome you to share in the chat box, go to my website, DLR Counseling Group, sign up for my grief calendar, download some helpful resources, and listen to other therapists and their unique perspectives on how they deal with their grief while helping others. I encourage you to stay the entire show. Thank you for attending and welcome to our forum, Buried Messages. Hello everyone, I am Danny Ross, as we talk, spoke earlier. I'm ex excited that you're here today. Um, you heard a little bit of my grief story and um, how that affected me. I want to introduce you to my co-host, Ms. Delora Evans. I'm gonna allow her to share a little bit about herself, who she is, what she does, and we also wanna hear her grief story. So we're just gonna call Delora right on up here and we're gonna listen to Delora as she shares a little bit about who she is and her grief story. Hey, Delora. Hey, hey, Danny. How are Hi, you? Everybody. I'm doing okay. Thank you for inviting me. I am excited to, uh, to get this opportunity. And um, as you kind of mentioned, I'm also an LPC supervisor. I have a private practice. I have a counseling agency over in Oak Cliff. I'm from Dallas. 
And um, I'm a cert I, my agency is a certified training institute through the state. I, that's the, the latest certification that I've gained. So I'll be able to help train counselors and therapists uh, with the credentials that I hold and, and through my agency. And uh, as you mentioned, um, my grief story, uh, kind of the, the things that you and I have been discussing is that nothing prepared me. I don't, I'm a therapist. First, I was a counselor before I became a therapist. And I've helped people navigate through their grief. And, and, and I knew about um, the five stages of grief, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And I knew mm -hmm. about what's acute grief and what's complicated grief and integrate. I knew all these things. And yes. so one thing I understand is that the head, all the intellect that I have, mm -hmm. and between the head and the heart, it's a short journey, but mm -hmm. it's a long, it's only 18 inches, but it may as well be a thousand miles because I had information in my head, but my heart is still in the preparation stage and, and, the, and the getting ready to really um, just keep going through the grief. Mm -hmm. uh, I just can't hardly put it in words about, um, I lost my sister. She was only 48 years old. I'm the oldest. Uh, she's six years younger than me. And uh, we found out in September last year that she had uh, cancer. And by November, she was gone. And it just so happened the, the last four days of her life, they let her, they let her come home on Thanksgiving on hospice. Yeah. This was just 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually took care of her with my mom. My mom is a caregiver. She's a certified caregiver. So I took care of my little sister. Uh, and now I wouldn't have volunteered for that. I was going over to just be there with my mom. And I, there, I wouldn't have signed up to mm -hmm. end up doing the things that I ended up doing mm -hmm. um, and watching her take her last breath. But by, I was just sitting by the bed looking at her mm -hmm. and the cover was heaving up and down and then it stopped. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't, you know, nothing prepared me for that. Right. Uh, the planning stage, you know, planning her funeral. I did the obituary, the, the slideshow. I put pictures together walking through memory lane. And I had a full practice at the time. Mm -hmm. I was seeing at least six clients a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a couple on Thursday. And I took Fridays off and having to try to navigate and help a person deal with what they were dealing with. Um, one thing about grief is that it won't wait. It won't. Like, I always have been able to compartmentalize my feelings. If I had a dispute with my mate that morning, I went to work and put it on the shelf and did my job. And either we talked about it during lunch or we talked about it at home, but grief it is kind of pervasive. It it doesn't, mm -hmm. I mean, a Facebook memory, a song, a thought, a smell could yes. open up the grief um <laughs> that that I feel and it just won't wait. It has to be addressed. So Lord, that's just part ask, of the grief story. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, you have a very unique um grief story because your grief story is also attached to a more recent grief story. Can you yes. share that? Uh, and so my, my sister passed away on November 30th of 2020 and uh, we, we funeralized her a full, we, you know, I don't, I think I must be ready. My sister wasn't prepared. So her older children had to like find burial documents and wonder, mm -hmm. did she have insurance? And I say, well, I guess I'm ready to die. Everything I have is in a little plastic <laughs> thing with a white yeah, top. Like, right. I have my, my, my insurance. My daughter knows, you know, everybody knows where everything's at. My pin numbers to my accounts. And, and I'm like, I want to be prepared, but my mm -hmm. sister wasn't. So fast forward into, um, we were just, I had just put up her little urn and her little gold boss picture. And I, I put them up and I took her pictures down because I want to see pictures so I can grieve. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, uh, we ready to, I'm ready to move on. And two days later, so this was November 29th. I mean, this was uh, March 29th of this year mm -hmm. is when I put everything away. On right. March 31st, my son-in-law and my grandbaby died in a tragic car wreck here in mm -hmm. Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And, and I, we got my, they called from Cook's children and they were calling my my 16 year old's phone because they had just got the insurance off the license plate mm -hmm. and the insurance is in my name. But instead of my phone coming up, hers did. And she was telling me they're calling from Cook's Children. It, it's, and we just didn't know what. And so I took our work and I went up to Cook's Children, not knowing mm 
mm-hmm. that I was getting ready to identify my grandson. Wow. My 22 month little grandson named Quaid. Wow. Uh, and that I was, I was the one. So this is, you know, how this is, look here. I never, the death that I experienced, my grandmother died. She was 92. Mm-hmm. My great grandmother, you know, I, I haven't mm-hmm. seen any tragedies. I've never seen a dead body that wasn't in a casket. Mm-hmm. So it's as if I went, like Drake said, I went from zero to 100 real quick. Right. As far as n- nothing, really not dealing with uh, mm-hmm. serious grief to mm-hmm. this. Exactly. So it kind of distorts your, it distorts what you kind of have set up for yourself. The world you know, the life you have prepared, what you're going to do tomorrow, that's all out the window. Yeah, everything is uh, subject to revision. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Up for grabs. I mean, and now we're trying to make sense of this whole event, a couple of events. And it's also real and it's also difficult. I want to show you a clip. Thank you so much, Delora, for being so open and so candid and sharing with us um, your grief story. And I think it's so important that we share our grief stories. That's why I'm asking everyone who's a panelist to share their grief story because it's part of the healing process. Yes. We can't heal what we don't talk about. That's right. We can't heal what we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. And so I love this clip. It's called, I call it Buried Messages. And if you notice what's on, what's throughout this video, we're going to talk about it a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and put that, that video up. There's something we don't talk about even though it affects each of us. All of us. It's something we carry wherever we go, the inevitable result of losing the people we love. That something is grief. Even if we're not grieving now, we carry the knowledge that someday death and grief will visit us and the people we care about. but we try so hard to avoid it. We try to shut it out. We mean well, but we don't know the right words to bring comfort. Far too often, we simply say nothing. We need to get better at grief. Wow, I love that clip because it really gives a great depiction of what happens with grief. We try to downplay it, we try to push it down Mm -hmm. and and what what did it say? Not grieving now, but we're going to grieve. At some point, yeah. we're all going to go through this grieving process. But as Americans, I think Americans in general, we yeah. are a people who try to avoid anything that's hurtful, anything that's painful, anything that brings us um, displeasure. And so if you notice, they all had on those T-shirts. Yeah. And they also had layers. And it so reminded me of my topic tonight, buried messages and how we love to to layer it up. Mm -hmm. And underneath there, there's Mm -hmm. so much more going on with different people. You notice there's a grandma that was lost. There's um, a husband, an uncle, a friend. Mm -hmm. But society sometimes doesn't allow us that space to grieve. Delora does it. No. Would you like to comment on what your thoughts were regarding what you, the video and your thoughts? Yes, thanks. Thank you, Danny. I know that uh, I was thinking about you were just saying um, we're not taught, you know, you know, there's mourning, there's bereavement, there's grief, mm-hmm. there's loss. So it's stages like we're not taught what you get three days. And that's yes. your, if you're working on a job, that's your mm-hmm. immediate family. 
So mm-hmm. it, are you saying in three days I should be good? And you may even right. have people saying, are you still, that's been, just get over it or right. it a long time ago, you know, things like that. But uh, being able to take the time, that's why I left pictures up because I'll start working mm-hmm. and I'll start taking care of my grandchildren and my 16 year old. I'll start doing all these things and I'll forget. And But grief is going to come out. So I left pictures up. And so uh, I let my sister Frida Martin was an actress. Like mm-hmm. she played on the movie Carter High. She okay. was Derek's mother. She played on uh, the, when when Dallas came back out. She was Sue Ellen's campaign manager on about four episodes. Okay. She has a she had a billboard. Like she has. So I sometimes I go and I look at clips of things that she's done on on um, YouTube because I have to I have to feel. You were saying. And it's mm-hmm. great that you say you, we can't heal what we don't talk about. Yes. And I, I got to add, we can't heal what we won't feel. Come on now. We can't we, heal we what it. we won't feel. We can't feel. See, we, wow. so, we act like we're so scared to feel. Like we're just going to crumble mm-hmm. into, you know, a, mm-hmm. a burst in mm-hmm. flames just because mm-hmm. of a feeling. I've mm-hmm. not read an obituary that said someone died because of a feeling. Come on. He was sad and he died. You know, maybe no. what they did with the feeling, <laughs> but no one just, you know, but that's what it, it just feels like that. And the, and the mm-hmm. only way out is through. Mm-hmm. I always say the breakthroughs and the walkthrough. And like you just said, my colleague, the yes. walkthroughs and the talk through. Yes. Come on, Delore. Uh, that is awesome. That is awesome. I'm going to keep moving because we have okay, so much moving. content okay. to share. I have a wonderful guest. I have Crystal Pinnock, L- better known as LPC Chris, and she has a, a great podcast show that she does. Let's bring LPC Chris on here, and she's going to share a little bit of her grief story, as well as who she is and what she does, and and how is she coping with grief and some things that she's found to be helpful. Welcome, LPC Chris. Yay! Hello, hello. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? Doing <laughs> great. So happy that you are joining us tonight to share in this um, this conversation on grief. And I know you and I have talked and corresponded several times. And you mentioned that you had a very unique um, grief story. And and I'm just going to start right where you are. First of all, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice and your podcast and what you do. Yes, I am LPC Chris, but I am Crystal Pinnock to everybody else here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I am licensed LPC MHSP here in Nashville, and I work uh, with the city of Nashville uh, counseling and case managing teens or youth uh, who are victims of crime. Mm. Uh, so any any type of crime, like sexual assaults, drive-bys, shootings, all of that, I, I counsel with those youth, um, mm. youth and families. I also teach groups uh, yes. with families, and, and so that's what I do here. And my passion is has become more grief informed, yes. being more grief informed, uh, because I know for myself that I struggled in the grieving journey because uh, I was a young griever. Um, yes. My brother passed when I was 14 years old, and he was mm. 18. He just wow. turned 18. Um, and he had uh, what we call acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Mm-hmm. Um, found out in September 13th, 1996, that he uh, that he had cancer, and mm-hmm. then he passed away April 10th of 1997. Uh, so that is my story. But I speak on behalf of people who have denied their grief. Yes, uh, I denied my grief uh, right. for at least three years. So I was in high school as a freshman in high school. So I tried to do what I needed to do as a student. I was failing classes. I had to take summer school. I just could not get geometry. I could not get algebra and I could not figure out no matter how many you gave me, I could not figure out this math. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just a very frustrating thing. I did not like being in high school. I was somewhat social, but I was somewhat quiet enough to get me by. That's that's what I was enough to get mm-hmm. by in order to graduate and come out of come out of college and mm-hmm. come out of high school and then go to college. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It was during that transition of leaving high school and going to college 
where grief just hit me. Yes. It was very exciting to be away, three hours away from home in Memphis mm -hmm. to go to college. But that transition being where I was caused a full year of depression. And at mm. 18, 19 years old, I had no clue what was wrong with me. I just knew that I could not keep food down. I remember feeling as if the night was so heavy on me. And when mm -hmm. it got to winter time and it got darker faster, I remember the night just feeling, I could feel it on my chest. And I was like, mm. I Time. I don't want to be in the dark because I can feel it way too much. Mm -hmm. I just cannot wait till daybreak so I yes. can breathe. Mm -hmm. I remember that and I had no clue what it was. No clue what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so I got the field and would yes. back and say, I was depressed. I was going through grief for mm -hmm. the first time. I was allowed to feel uh, mm -hmm. because you are a surviving sibling. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. the name of my podcast. I have a podcast called Surviving Sibling Loss, yes. the Forgotten Mourners podcast. Mm -hmm. And we are, as siblings, we are forgotten mourners. Um, wow. uh, are concerned about our parents, um, how mm -hmm. are they doing. And if you're a young grieving, and even if you're a little bit more seasoned, people mm -hmm. are more concerned about maybe if, you're a, if your sibling had family. Right. <laughs> so, but when it comes to grief, your sibling, mm -hmm. you are a mourner. So those right. are our companions, our first companions. Mm -hmm. They are historians. Mm -hmm. They are the two when we need to talk about our parents, you talk about life. And when yes. you lose a big entity in your mm -hmm. life, like it's like losing a piece of yourself. Exactly. So yes, I was Crystal, I want to ask a question real fast. Yes. I, I heard you sharing that a lot of times kids are forgotten in this pro process of grieving. We're not often asked the question, how are you doing? What's going on with you? Is there anything that I could do to help you? Um, how does this affect you? How can people start making efforts to check in on the little ones, the teenagers, those young adults? How can they do that, Crystal? Don't forget about it okay to ask them questions it is okay to say hey do you need a break and that's why i do what i do right now mm -hmm. is because i was there and nobody asked me the question while i was at school you spend majority of your time in other places outside of your home mm -hmm. uh teachers know that you have lost someone but they don't ask that question it's business as usual you come mm -hmm. back to school you do what you have to do your after school activities you're expected to make your a Mm -hmm. And then move on. They don't think mm -hmm. that children experience stress, mm -hmm. depression, or grief. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're very young, they feel like you are able to get over that grief faster mm -hmm. because you have to talk about it. But it comes out in other ways. It comes out in other ways. Yeah. Crystal, I know when I was a, 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 a elementary counselor, high school counselor, a lot of times what we encourage kids to do is get back to your routine. Get back to your routine. And I think it's a good idea. However, we need to implement some other things into that going back to your routine versus just go back to your routine and do what else? What else do we need to be doing? Right, right. exactly. And that is not only, I think later on in life, now that I'm grown, we have more opportunities to be able to serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. There was a I had just a guidance counselor. She was concerned about my grades and whether mm -hmm. or not I would graduate. And that was it. I didn't have a, a school counselor that was concerned about mm -hmm. my brother, concerned about the yes. fact that I watched a young man mm -hmm. go from viable to dead in seven months. So yes. I just marched on because everybody else was marching on until everyone college. else. Yeah. And, and, and that's what we learn to do. We learn to move sometimes to yeah. other people's movement, what they expect of us, what we need to do. This is what he would have wanted. How do you know? Yeah. How, how do Danny, you know? can I say can I say yes. something on please, that? Please, please. Okay, please. so you know my baby girl, Grace, she's 16. Mm. And so she was 14 when Quaid was born, and she was able to go. Her big sister, Faith, my daughter, she mm -hmm. was able to be a birth buddy 
because she was old enough. She wasn't old enough for the first two children because my daughter has uh, three mm -hmm. children. She would, and um, so Grace was able to go in and watch Quaid be born. So mm -hmm. Quaid was like her little, I called her emotional support baby. Like it was her and mm -hmm. Quaid. So my daughter, um, I, you know, I like to say, like have we been saying, that I wasn't ready or I wasn't, but really I think I had the mechanics down because now I'm having an epiphany. Like I knew the things to do mechanically. mechanically. Like I knew to put pictures up so I could grieve. I knew not to hide it. I knew these things from being in the field, but I think what I'm yeah. struggling with is these feelings that I'm not mm -hmm. used to. Wow. And what to do with oh, making sure I don't start overeating, making sure I don't start over shopping, making sure I don't start trying to fix the feelings. And just yes. like I say, the only way out is through and I got to go through the feelings. But I, I actually made sure at the school that she took, took the time. I, I, I advocated for her. Uh, she's in therapy. We uh, Fort Worth has the warm place. We have our yes. intake session there. Because I think, like I say, the mechanics of what we know to do, because mm -hmm. I, we were just saying, well, I wasn't ready, but we were ready with information. Like we have yes. information. Yes. And so I knew to yes. do that, but I'm, I'm still feeling like I'm in a vortex when it comes mm -hmm. down to how I feel daily yes. and navigating how, through these feelings. Yeah. How you're navigating through those feelings. Yeah. Thank you so much, LPC Chris and Delora. Yeah, that was you. such thank you, great thank information. You, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for thank sharing you. that information. I have another yeah. amazing guest. Uh, I have Blaze. We're just going to go straight. I want to make sure I get this good information in here, Delora. Is that okay with you that we just keep yeah, going? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, let's go. go. Let's go. Well, I have Blaze Harris. He's a phenomenal guest of mine. I have been following Blaze for quite some time. And I told Blaze, I said, one of the things that I love about you is your vulnerability. You are OK with allowing people to see the full authentic you. And as men, we've been given messages that, that say, don't cry. You're um, soft if you cry. You're this or you're that. We're in a place now, we got so much going on in our lives that we have to start working and dealing with our emotions because our emotions are going to take us out if we don't yes, deal with those yeah, things that's exactly the way right. that they should. Let's yeah. bring uh, Blaze on here. Hey, thanks hey. for having me, Danny. Hey, hey, hey Blaise, how are you? Hey, hey Mr. Lord, how are you? Doing I'm doing well, I'm doing well. So, so Blaze, what I want to do is give us a little bit about your um, your background, what you're doing, and and just go immediately into your grief story and share with us and anything that you find pertinent or important when it comes to grief. And I appreciate you so much for being here. Oh well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Um, yes. I am, my name is Blaze. I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor associate and a licensed clinical addiction specialist associate here. Um, based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, mm -hmm. Before I got into the mental health world, I was a firefighter for 14 years for two different departments. So I've seen my fair share of stuff on top of dealing with the stuff that I, you know, that I deal with personally. Um, um, basically, what I like to do in my practice, I focus um, mainly with black males, you know, mm -hmm. for that very reason, like you said before, you know, we're not allowed to express and deal with exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I deal yeah. with a lot of black males and I also deal with first responders because mm -hmm. I know that first responders aren't going to just talk to anybody. They want to be That's able to right. talk to someone. Who yes, actually yes. gets it? Who, who yes. gets it? Who's not going to look down on it, but also understands the lingo and the stuff that we go through. Yes. So y'all, y'all about made it tough for me. Listen, watch the video. <laughs> listen to y'all stories. Like, Danny, your your intro about got me. I was like, how am I supposed to talk about this stuff? Man, <laughs> I'm glad so, I recorded. <laughs> right, right. So man, I was sitting there, I was like, I'm gonna be fucking fucking get you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so my yes. my grief story. I uh, much like um, much like Mr. Lord did. I lost a I lost a sibling, mm -hmm. um, and LPC Chris. I lost a sibling. My um, my younger brother mm -hmm. um, died February twenty fifth of this year, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I have been um, dealing with the most about this is the fact that I have been way more angry than mm -hmm. normal. my temper is like this 
and I am doing everything that I can to to monitor it, monitor it, to mm -hmm. manage it, to handle it in the best way that I need to do. And y'all know how it is. It's like mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm mad. I'm sad. I'm yes. frustrated. And it's just like the big spot for me is I'm a fixer. Mm -hmm. You know, even with it, with you know being a first responder, my job is to fix things. When people call me at their worst times, I'm supposed to fix it. And the the biggest part for me is I can't fix this. Wow. Oh. I can't I can't fix this. I can't yeah. I can't bring my I can't bring my brother back. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't I can't make my mom feel better. Yes. I can't I can't yeah. make my nieces feel better, my nephew feel better. Yeah. I can't make myself feel better. And there's mm -hmm. so many different things. And it's like and I, I love how you said um one of the things that people say earlier is like, you know. They wanted they. This is what they would have wanted you to do. They would have wanted you to get through it. And you said, "How yeah. you know?" And that's my <laughs> yeah. thing. My yeah. thing is like, I'm like, yeah. my thing is this. I'm like, I don't, I don't know that. My see, I know that my brother, I know that my brother didn't. He didn't deal with emotions. He didn't mm -hmm. like dealing with any of that kind of stuff. Um, he would have just pushed it on and yes. and, and yeah. kept going through yeah. and like it was nothing. I ain't yeah. built like that. <laughs> right. I, right. I ain't built like that. You know, right. I think I think Mr. I think Mr. Laura said that she like compartmentalized. I'm great at that. <laughs> I can I can do that. I, I'm so used to putting this mask on because that's what everybody expects of me. Everybody expects me to be um okay. Everybody expects mm -hmm. me to be I'm the one that's supposed to fix everything. I'm a, I'm the one that's supposed right. to be sure that everybody right. else is okay. Right. Um I'm supposed to be sure that everybody else is okay. I'm not allowed to have these feelings like I remember going down there um, to my mom's house and, you know, everybody's worried about what my cousins are doing and oh. how they're okay. Um, and being sure that everybody else and like my aunts and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody checked on me. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember, yeah. I, re I remember going into a room and journaling and just mm -hmm. writing about it. And then it's like nobody like noticed I was gone until finally my grandma came upstairs wow. and she said, she said, Blaze, are you OK? I said, no, I'm not. Thank you. Mm. I'm not because mm -hmm. everybody's so worried about what everybody else is doing. But y'all don't realize that was my brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. That was my brother. And I nobody's asking me how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Nobody's asking me what it is that I need. Mm -hmm. But I'm supposed to take care of everybody else. Yes, yes. Yeah. Blaze, I want to ask a question. Um, mm -hmm. How do we make help people understand how to see us during our grief? How do we how do we help people um, see us in our grief versus trying to ignore us in our grief? <sighs> For me. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna keep it real with you. I'm upfront and in the yes. face about it. Good. I don't I don't sugarcoat and say, oh, I'm okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Because that's how that's how but people yeah. ain't gonna never check on you. They always saying, Oh, I'm all right, yep. I'm good. Yep. I don't yep. need to do yep. other stuff. You know, yep. but you like you're crying for help on the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's I mean, like on the inside, it's like you're crying for help, but you don't wanna say, Hey, I need mm -hmm. help. Because exactly. you know, you don't want you don't want to yeah. seem like you're weak, you don't want to seem like you can't handle it, you don't want to seem like you're struggling. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the reality is we are, and it's okay. You're supposed to. Exactly. You're supposed you're supposed to deal with these things. You're yeah. supposed to cry. You're supposed to That's yell. Right. You're supposed to, yeah. you're supposed to wanna, yeah, yeah. you know, not deal with people. You're supposed to wanna just be angry because exactly. you're allowed to. And that's exactly. the thing, is it's like, no, I'm I'm mad. I'm mad about this thing. That's I don't right. want, you know, and I'm just like, I'm allowed to be mad. Don't tell me not mm -hmm. to be. Don't mm -hmm. tell me to get over. Don't tell me to 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 you know he wouldn't want you, he would want you to move on. I don't want to hear that shit stuff. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> hey, hey, this is a real script. We just gonna keep it going and be real. Yeah, hey. yeah. yeah I don't. I don't. That's the. Way, I don't want to hear that shit. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the thing. I don't. Mm -hmm. Don't tell mm -hmm. me. Don't tell me what I need to do. What's gonna be best for me? Because you don't know. You don't know yeah, what's you don't best know. for me. You don't yeah. know oh what's best gosh. for me. 
Oh my God! You don't know it's like, like how are you gonna how are you gonna know what's best for me when I don't know what the hell is best for me right now? Mm. Yeah. That's that's real talk. Thank you, Tamika. So, Thank you. So, yes. that's, that's, that's the thing. So I'm doing everything that I can to manage all these stuff. So mm -hmm. I've been I've been I've been journaling a lot more. I've been working mm -hmm. out a lot more. I've been painting a lot more. I've been mm -hmm. beating beating the mess out of my heavy bag a whole lot more. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm playing all these stuff. Oh, I seen in the co in the comment, he's in a better place. Mm. Ooh. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I'm not trying to hear that right now. I love I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to hear that right now, yo. I'm not. Yes. I'm not yes. trying to hear that right now. I'm right. not. You know what right. I want you to do? You know what I want you to do? What? Really what I want you to do is sit down, shut the hell up, and just be there with me. Come on. That's it. That's it. That's it. I don't need you to, it. It. Need you to yeah. talk to me. I don't yeah. need you to I don't need you to yeah. tell me what to do. I just need yeah. you to sit there and be yeah. supportive. I had a um yeah. I have a I have a homeboy who comes and trains with me. We do more time uh -huh. together. And you know me, I'm never I never knock people for what they believe. You know, yes. he's a he is a he is a strong Christian. He believes in his he's believes in the word, he believes in the faith, and I support him 150%. Exactly. You know, so and that's the thing. For me, I got questions. Mm. But, so the thing about it for me, I was he asked me what was going on. And I told him that I was, you know, I was just not, I'm not in a good space. Mm -hmm. He started preaching to me about what God says in the Bible. And I I, I, I let him do it. Mm -hmm. But at yeah. the end, I texted him later. I said, bro, I said, I didn't need Pastor Eric. Mm. I needed my man E. E. I yeah. needed I needed my man E right then. Mm -hmm. I needed, I needed you just to sit there, hold me. And let me cry on your shoulder. That's right. Yeah. That's what I needed right then. And when I told him that, he was like, oh, my God. I am oh, so yes. sorry. Yeah. He said, I am so sorry. And yeah. now, when it gets to the point now when we talk, he tells me, he said, hey, what is it that you need? Yeah. What is it you need? What is it that you yeah. need? And that's yeah. the thing. And that's what, and that's I think it. that's one of the things that we're so afraid. We're so afraid to tell people. We're so, we're so afraid to tell people. Don't preach mm -hmm. to me right now. Exactly. Don't talk to me about this yeah. stuff. Like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that right now. Blaze, I want to ask, have you heard the phrase? Because somebody put it in the comments and they said, um, I am so tired of hearing I have to be strong. And they said, oh. Why? <laughs> Teresa, I think that was you. And we've talked about that. And that's my biggest gripe. Why do I have to be strong? For who? I yeah. mean, that does yeah. nothing for me. Yeah. And th thank you, Teresa. Teresa, so frustrating when you are mm -hmm. faced with losing a loved one, but we are told to be strong. Why? Mm -hmm. I can't. I'm sad. Mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed. I'm empty. Yes. And so those yeah. are the authentic yeah. feelings yeah. that we yeah. have to attend to. They need you to be. Time. They need you to be strong for exactly. them. Yeah. For See, them. People need you That's to be strong for them because people are uncomfortable with death, yes. and so they're uncomfortable too. So they, you know, and we teach people how to treat us. You Come know, we on, like he told his friend, I don't need the pastor. When I need a scripture, I'll call you and say, hey, what, what does first John so-and-so say about mm -hmm. this and that? Because, you know, the, of course, we hear that that scripture, weeping may endure for a night, but joy mm -hmm. cometh in the morning. Okay, okay. And, and the thing about it is I always check in with someone else's belief system before I put mine in. That's true. I always That's check true. in. I don't, I, but see, these are the things we've been told. Like, and That's just true. like me having, um, knowing that there's no malicious intent to the mm -hmm. questions people were asking, but then people were kind of macabre when they, it was a terrible car wreck. It was all over the new, the, you know, mm -hmm. here in Fort it's a small community. And so mm -hmm. I found people that would, yeah, I want to drop off some uh, uh, dinner. We'll get, get pizza. And I say, mm -hmm. okay, this is the first two or three days after my son-in-law and grandbaby died. <laughs> so they would come over and I'd open the door. Hey, how you doing? Give them a hug. And they say, mm -hmm. what happened? I mean, right. who was driving? Yeah. I mean, it was right. like people were, uh, are attracted to the macabre. And yes. then people are repelled. So it's right. like two extremes. You got the people that are repelled and don't know what to say, and they they, they went ghost. Then you got the people that are attracted, and they, you, they want to ask with all these questions. And uh, it was very exhausting. My daughter's phone was in that car, so therefore, mm -hmm. I because he was only going to the store, and they got right. hit. 
And so I had to wield all the phone calls from her job. She's an RN. From all of my friends, I have mentees. Yes. I have people that want to be helpful but don't know how. And, yes. uh, and we really, I really taught people how to treat me during this time. We are yes. human beings, not human yes. doings. Yes. Just be. Like he got the brother just said, just be. Just be. I'm going <laughs> to interject be. because yeah. we have so much amazing okay. content. Go ahead. Interject. Yeah, go ahead. Blaze, thank you so much for your thank information. Thank you, Blaze. My co host, Dolores, she is bringing the fire. <laughs> I am just excited tonight. And this will not be our last one. I see that okay. we have more to explore and more to talk about. I'm going to bring my sister on here. I'm going to bring Tay. Tay. Tay is a life coach. And we've been friends for quite some time. And, and she's going to bring probably a different perspective, but that's why I wanted to have such diversity because our grief is so personal and how we handle our grief is so unique and it's so connected to our constructs. All of us have these unique constructs. And I was attending a class and the guy was talking about how we attach to whatever we have experienced in the past when it comes to how we deal with grief. So if we had a poor experience with grief, we're probably going to handle it the same way. Silence, not talking about it, not being real, not being authentic. So I want to bring Tay on here to share with us as, as a parent, as a friend, and, and as a life coach. Um, so tell us a little bit about you, um, your your practice and what you're doing, Tay. Come on up here, Tay. Good evening. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Tay. Right. So tell us a little bit about your who you are, what you do, and and go if you'll go into your grief story. I can. Uh, so what I do is I'm a certified life strategies coach. I also am an empowerment speaker and published author. I am the resident services and housing case management manager at uh, mm -hmm. the organization I currently work at. Um, my organization works with um, people who are currently living with AIDS or HIV, mm -hmm. uh, wow. other mental health disorders. So I have been in social work and social services for about 28 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Helping people. So tell us yeah. a little bit about your grief story and, and, and how that you're I guess we've all had grief ongoing, but your most recent, if you if you don't mind. Uh, my grief story, um, like Laura, was one of those things that uh, found its way to the the news and the media and everybody. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I lost my daughter, my 27 year old daughter, April 21st, 2018. Um, we categorize it as domestic violence, even though there was no ongoing violence. Mm -hmm ended and uh, because it ended, he decided that he couldn't accept it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She showed up at my daughter's home one night. Uh, she was home from work. She had taken off. She has three, she had very, very, very little babies at the time. He showed up at her home, knocked on the door, began to kick on the door. And, and my daughter very much like myself is a fixer mm -hmm. and uh, opened the door to, to address it, to deal with it because it was becoming disruptive to her living environment, the community she lived in. Mm -hmm. uh, when she opened the door, it just took a turn for the worse and her three children mm -hmm. were home when she was shot five times and killed. Wow, wow. How do you find yourself navigating through these different channels that we've been talking about? You know, we talk about the, the anger and the denial and the bargaining, the acceptance. And then we go back to, I, I love this, uh, the constructivism approach to where what does our construct tell us about how I'm going to deal with the loss? Um, talk to me a little bit about that, Tay. I, I guess maybe everything I've ever done in my life, which at the time I did not realize that everything I had done, all the work, all the opportunities, all the arenas I, I had gladiated in had mm -hmm. all prepared for what I was not prepared for. Oh, that's good. That's that good. Is good. That's good. Was, oh, it it good. doesn't come to you immediately. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. come to you immediately because you're so accustomed to showing up in, in, in as that substitute. Yes. For mm -hmm. people who are going through. 
We show mm-hmm. up for them. And we know what our job is. We know what's required of us. We know that our emotional state of being is to be compartmentalized and, and backburnered while we make the person that we've come to serve the priority. Mm-hmm. What we don't realize is in all that, all that that we've been taught, we yes. are also being educated on how to deal with grief. Mm-hmm. When it's your own personal tragedy, what, mm-hmm. one of the things I find that uh, is that uh, frequent intense grief and loss becomes trauma when it's unchecked. Mm-hmm. All right. And yes. Yes. grief have two completely different grief and healing process. Mm-hmm. So when you find yourself dealing with a combination of the two, it's, it, it's, it becomes extremely important to recognize that you're not just dealing with loss and grief. You're also dealing with trauma. To walk right. onto a, a site and find that my daughter was murdered, who has never done anything mm-hmm. in life to anyone that would warrant mm-hmm. or this, this form of violence toward her was traumatizing before mm-hmm. it was brief. Mm-hmm. Before it was brief. Mm-hmm. So yes. as I journeyed through it, I had to recognize that, oh my God, I'm not just dealing with grief. I'm also dealing with trauma. Yes, the trauma. I agree. Thank you so I much, Tay, for you sharing so much. with us. Thank you. I so appreciate you sharing. Yes. yes, we are so sorry for Thank your you. loss. Thank you. I do want to, um, I think that's a good place to segue into the next video. I think this video kind of talks about what we've been talking about. Just the idea of I was here, I've been here, and we need to continue to have that conversation. And a lot of times we've been taught to let go, write a letter that says goodbye. We have to figure out how are we going to form healthy attachments? How are we going to form re- recreate some healthy attachments versus maybe the, some of those negatives. We accept the reality for what it is, but the person is still there and mm-hmm. we create healthy attachments to the person who is no longer with us in flesh, but now in spirit. Um, let's go to that clip, um, Jasmine. I understand that people don't want to say the wrong things, but one of the difficult parts for me is People don't talk about Nate. They'll ask about my girls, ask about my grandchildren, but they will not. It it is as if he never existed. And that's rough because I like to talk about Nate. He's, he, he was, he, he's my son. I would say, even if you ask me a question about Nate and it got me choked up, that's Okay, I I don't mind. To be able to share a little bit of his life is wonderful. I've heard. I love that piece because it reminds me to always check in with with, with who's grieving. Just because you don't want to talk about your loved one doesn't mean we want to put to bed our loved one. That's right. right. Our loved one is is ever present. She's here with me tonight. My brother-in-law, Curtis, is here with me tonight. They are all here rooting me on. I feel their spirit, the tangibleness of them. And that's something you can't take from me. No. Um, I want to go quickly into this next one. Um, Can I bring all the panelists up real fast? Real fast. If I can bring all panelists up. If we're still here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to just kind of sum all of this up. And as I have all panelists on stage, I want to talk about ways that we can help. Ways that we can help um, people who are grieving. Um, ways that other people can help us who are grieving. And I think sometimes people get uncomfortable when it's the therapist who is grieving. And I'm very candid now. I'm like, I just lost my sister. I may cry through your session because you're talking through, you know, I'm not boohooing it out on the floor, but I let them know that I connect with you probably in a way like someone else wouldn't because I feel your pain. Mm -hmm. What are some significant things, um, LPC Chris, that we can do to help people 
as they navigate this this thing called grief? Uh, one thing that I have learned is that I cannot treat grief as if it's something I need to be over. Like, mm -hmm. I need to step yeah. over grief, or I need to work hard. I need got this formula that one day it's all going to disappear for me. I'm not going to ever have it again. Life is going to be back normal the way it was before the before the death. And it's never going to be the same way ever again. Mm -hmm. I think I lost it. Something in my entire DNA changed because mm -hmm. I felt it that mm -hmm. much. And I still, 24 years later, feel the loss of my brother. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have to check myself when it comes to issues of abandonment. I have yeah. to check mm -hmm. spirituality. I also have to check every, uh, other people about rushing. Because I love rush people out of love to rush people out of sadness because sadness yes. is uncomfortable. I am okay with feeling uncomfortable. Yes. So, yeah. To be okay and let people be okay in being ugly, crying, wailing, yeah. whatever they have to do, whether they they snotting at the nose or whether they are mad, like Blaze said earlier, you have to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. to be able to work through the journey, not get over, but work, mm -hmm. yeah, through. work through. I think that's where yes. people are wrong. That we're not trying to get mm -hmm. to this topic yeah. place. We're yeah. not. Yes. And acceptance yes. doesn't mean that everything is okay. That exactly. just means that I know that my love is not here in the flesh anymore. Yes. So understanding those um, those kind of highlights when it comes mm -hmm. to being a therapist, if you're a, a pastor, a minister, or somebody yes. who is helping someone grieve, mm -hmm. or you talking to yourself, because we also say to ourselves, "Man, I just need to get over. I just need to. I just need mm -hmm. to." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, Talk to yourself the way other people talk to you, and that is not yes. nurturing yourself exactly. at all. LPC Chris, I'm going to have to stop right there because I want to get another person in real fast. Let's let's go ahead and break it up with the brother here. Let's get Blaze in here. To, I want you to take the same question and just give us like 30 seconds of, you know, things that we can do to help navigate this thing called grief. Well, the biggest thing for me, and I think LPC Chris did a great job of just wrapping yeah. it up. My thing is you know how we tell, you know, we meet our clients where we are, mm -hmm, where they are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They got to do the same thing for us. If we, if you know that we're going through it, meet us where we are. Don't try to dag on, put us where you want us to be. Let us be where mm -hmm. we are. Let us mm -hmm. deal with things like we need to deal with it. Don't try to, like I said, don't try to fix it. Mm -hmm. Don't try to make it, you know, just be there for me. Mm -hmm. Just be there. Be that shoulder. You know, yes. be that rock. Last time mm -hmm. I talked, rocks, rocks. Last time I thought, rocks don't talk. Rocks don't say anything. Yeah. Just sit Come there. On. You just know what I mean? That's there. all I need to do. Just sit there and just be present with me. I don't need anything else. Sometimes exactly. your presence is more. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's, so, that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Blaze. I want to, I want everybody to stay on panel. Please stay with me. But I want to hear from people who are in the audience. I want to hear what this is doing for me, for you. I want you to type in the comments. I want you to let us know if you want more of this because I prepared a whole thing of information. Delora and I prepared some information. We ain't got through a third of it. So <laughs> it's so much more. But what I want to do right now, be giving those comments in the text and, and let us know what you need, how you want us to be a part, how you want to be a part of this again through those messages. Type, yeah. start typing, let us know. Okay, yeah. can we show that last video, Jasmine? Thank you so much. Many people will say, let me know what you need. That's not helpful. Expecting the person who's bereaved to be able to identify what they need from you is, is like giving a non-mathematician a very complex math problem and telling them, figure out the answer and then let me know what it is. What the bereaved need is that friend, that neighbor to say, hey, I'm going to pick up the kids today. So being very concrete about the help that's being offered would truly help the bereaved as opposed to just saying, my deepest condolences. Let me know if you need anything.
especially in those early days, anything you can do as a support person that makes those mundane and ordinary things easier so that your grieving person or your grieving family can have the luxury of just being devastated. A great way to do that would be saying, I'm going to offer some things and you let me know if that's something that you would like. I would love to come over on Tuesday and pick up the recycling. Would that be okay with you? I would love to come over and clean your house for you. Would that be okay? One friend just called me up and said, hey, I've hired a laundry service. They're coming to your house. All you have to do is stick all the dirty laundry in a trash bag, hand it to the person. They're going to wash it, dry it, fold it, and bring it back to you tomorrow. And it was like, oh, that, that's great. I would have never thought to ask. Like, she just said, it's already done. Um, are you going to be home at six? Y yeah. And great, they'll be there at six and just have it in trash bags. After we. Wow, 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 wow. I had a, that, that, that's real that's good. good. And what I like about it is it yeah. gave practical things that we can yes, do that a person to help. Can do. Yes, 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 yes. I want to ask Tay that same question that we talked about. How can someone help? navigate this thing called grief and, and people help us along the way. What 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 can what can we do? What can others do? Well one of the things that others can remember that you can start by remembering that when you lose a family member, the whole family's like a body. So when someone is gone, the rest of the body tries to compensate for what is missing. Mm. As if you lost a sense, it's lost like you lost a, a limb. You need to appreciate the fact that these people are trying to compensate for what is no longer there. One of the things you want to also be a part of is reminding the person, not necessarily right out, but let them talk about their, their person. It's okay to say their name. Mm -hmm. It's okay to mention right. that they're gone. Yeah. It's okay to express yourself, but do not steal the grief mic. Yeah. That's good. You dropped the mic on that, Vic. Yeah. I mean, Tay, you dropped the mic on that, yeah. Tay. That we get to laugh that we forget. We forget, yeah. we do. And we come in and we start talking about our grief and someone says, I was feeling the same way. I, yeah. I, I'm yeah. sorry, I just need to yeah. share what I feel. Yeah. I feel yeah. the same way. And you're like, you don't yeah. feel the same yeah. way. No. You will never, yeah. truly ever feel the same way. So let yeah. me say how I feel. And then yes. you just sit in how I feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the last thing I want to add to that is for us, those of us who are grieving, it helped me a lot day to day, sometimes multiple times throughout the day to remind myself that I did not die. Oh it's okay. God. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to be okay because if the worst thing that could have ever happened in my mm -hmm. life has happened and it did not kill me, literally in that moment, when a police officer told me my daughter was dead, I should have died and I did not. Yeah. Then I know that grief has a beginning, a middle and an end, and I am not gonna die. That's yeah. right, that's right. Oh that's my good. gosh, yeah. you, Tay, I'm gonna put that, Thank I you. had to remind myself that, that I did that not, I did not die. die. That's I did right. not. Delora, that's I'm gonna give here. you a, a minute yeah. to, my co-host okay. is phenomenal. I love how she brings I, it to I, and us. And I love everything that everybody said because it, it helped me. The point that I want to make uh, is kind of piggybacking off of Tay. It's like, there's no cookie cutter way to do this. Like I'm giving some tidbits and some tips and some what helped me, but there's no just standardized cookie cutter way to yes. grieve. Yes. And and to feel and to say today I'm okay. I'm living with my daughter and her children. My daughter who lost her husband. We all live together. So not only am I navigating through my own grief, I'm having to attend to my children as they grieve. Wow. And then the babies are only four and five, but we talk about their little brother. They know they had a little brother named mm -hmm. Coy. His pictures are up right now. They talk about their dad. Their dad was a rapper. They listen to his music. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we, we, we're we keeping it alive. But just like she just said, we didn't die. And my daughter is pregnant. They had just found out that wow. they hadn't even told everybody yet when he died. And so we just did her reveal. We, we did a true reveal. We, we, cause we, we, everybody found out together. Only her best friend knew the gender. 
We had never done anything yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we're still living and that may make people think, oh, they're smiling. Some of my mentees, it did. It made them think that I was okay. But yes. I have to remind people, ask me how I'm doing. When we get ask on the phone, don't just rush into what's going on with you. Ask me how I'm doing. That's right. And, and, and That's you right. know, so, um, but thank you. Thank y'all. Well, I just, wow. I got so much out of this. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Delora, my co-host with the mostest, she <laughs> is the bombest. Uh, Blaze, my realist <laughs> of the realist. Tay, who just, who just dropped the mic oh, and just gave it. us that piece yeah. of gold. Yeah. LPC Chris, who just <laughs> made it all real for us and tied so much of these grief stories into a way that we could really make some sense of it a little bit yeah. better. Um, yeah. Thank you, audience, for attending with us thank tonight. You. I have thank so you. enjoyed yes. everybody, yes. your comments. Yes. I couldn't get to everybody, but I want you to know that we hear you and we see you. Yes. I want to yes. give it up to my phenomenal uh, <laughs> producer of this show, Jasmine. Jasmine Productions Company. I can't think of the right name right now. Um, <laughs> but Jasmine Smith and, and, and her production company, phenomenal. Thank you so much for this thank show you, and you, her yeah. donating her time yeah. to this show I, because it's so important. Thank you so much thank for you, this. Jazz. Thank, thank you, you thank all you. so very yeah. much. And yeah. she's going to share with us some um, people in our community who specialize in grief um, right. and loss. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.